Hi, everybody. This is Sarah Hackney at the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We are going to go ahead and get started with the webinar. Hope you're in the right place. This is, uh, as, as you can see hopefully on your screens, this is a webinar hosted by the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition aimed at helping you get a better sense of what's going on with the Food Safety Modernization Act proposed rules. Um, we are going to be here for about an hour and a half today, and we're really excited to have a conversation with you. And with that, let's get started. What's on tap for the next hour and a half? Here we go. So just to get things started, we'll, we'll open up with a little bit of context. Food safety, local food, sustainable agriculture, conservation. What's the connection? Uh, what exactly is that Food Safety Modernization Act? What does it have to do with sustainable agriculture? And, and why should I get involved? Why does this matter? Uh, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the rules. Uh, we're going to talk a little about the overview. What are some of the challenges and issues with those rules? And then we'll work you through some options that you've got for taking action and speaking out to FDA. So hopefully, and within each section, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers from folks. First, just to give you a sense of who we are and uh, what we're doing here today. So myself and my colleague Ariane Lati both work at the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition based in Washington, DC. INTAG is an alliance of grassroots organizations from around the country. We work on all kinds of federal food and farm policy. We bring farmers and grassroots voices to the table to help shape and improve federal policy for a better and more sustainable future for our food and farms. So we are doing quite a lot of work with regards to food safety, and we're really excited to share a little bit of that info with you today around particularly the Food Safety Modernization Act. So I'll let my colleague Ariane in just a minute get you into some of the nuts and bolts about FISMA, but just to get started, you if you signed up for this webinar today, you've probably got a little bit of interest in this issue. Maybe you've heard something, maybe you've read a newspaper article, or you've You've got a sense that this is something that you're interested in that you'd like to learn a little bit more about. As you may know, um, the Food Safety Modernization Act is really represents the first sort of full-scale modernization of our nation's food safety rules since the 1930s. As we all know, safe food is really important. Everyone has a role in ensuring that our food supply is safe. But as these rules are these rules right now, as proposed by FDA, they also pose some concerns for folks for sustainable agriculture, for organic growers, for folks interested in local and regional food work, and for folks and for on-farm conservation. Just want to give you a sense, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we concerned? Here's just a couple of examples. We'll get into a little more as we go along. Right now, these draft rules, the reason we're, con we're concerned for a number of reasons, just to give you a few. For one, they're going to have a huge impact on farmers across the country, especially organic and sustainable growers. Um, they, the cost of compliance, we're concerned, could put many farmers out of business. These rules, if we cannot improve them, they're going to impact communities' ability to provide fresh, healthy food access, including in schools, hospitals, and in corner stores, places that are food deserts, through projects like Food Hubs. They're going to make it harder for beginning farmers to get started and to succeed, and they're, they run the risk of reducing choices for consumers at local markets and making local food harder to find in communities. These are just a few really broad reasons that we're concerned about the rules in the current form in which they exist. Uh, what we're going to do next is kind of, my colleague Arian is going to walk you through in kind of some detail what exactly is up with these rules, uh, what they look like, the nuts and bolts of what they say. And I'll say uh, for the layperson, if you're just coming to it as a beginner, stick with us. There's a lot of information. It's really worth listening and learning. If you're a farmer especially, the details are going to matter to you. And after that, we'll take a little time for questions. And then we'll get into some context about just what you can do to get involved and to make sure that our voices are heard in speaking out to FDA and ensuring that some of the concerns that I've just outlined and that we're going to get into some more detail are fixed before these rules become final law of the land. And I'll just note, uh, thank you folks who have already started to type questions into the chat box. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before I hand it over. Uh, keep typing those questions. 
we'll take them a few at a time uh, every time we get a chance. And if we do not get to your question during the presentation, we will gladly follow up with you via email after the fact. All right, and with that, I will ask if my colleague Siobhan, also at INTAC, is on the line, if she could hand the slide deck over to Ariane. Hi, everyone. My name is Ariane Lotti. I am the Assistant Policy Director for the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. And I'm going to be walking you through the proposed FISMA rules today. Before I do that, I just want to talk a little bit about NSAC's approach to food safety. Um, whoops, I don't know what's going on. One second, sorry. We're having screen problems. OK. Um, all right, sorry about that, a little technical glitch. So their approach to food safety, it's based on four basic principles here on the slide. The first is that everyone has a role in ensuring a safe, uh, a safe food system from farm to fork. But we really need to focus on the highest risks in the supply chain. So their approach to food safety, it's based on four basic principles here on the slide. The first is that everyone has a role in ensuring a safe, uh, a safe food system from farm to fork. But we really need to focus on the highest risks in the supply chain and target um, regulations to those highest risks. In addition, one size does not fit all. Uh, that means that regulations should be tailored to the scale, the type of operation, and the type of supply chain, and uh, that there shouldn't just be regulations uh, that the same types of regulations that apply to you know, a large farm that grows lettuce to be served all across the country and a farm that markets directly uh, through farmers markets. And then we really want um, the regulations to be based on scientific evidence when possible. And this has been an issue because ultimately the science around uh, on-farm food safety practices is not fully developed and there are a lot of questions still to be answered around that. So we're really trying to understand what the best way forward is in terms of also uh, what the scientific evidence shows. So getting now into the um, Food Safety Modernization Act itself. So FISMA, the first major overhaul, it's, it was the first major overhaul to the food safety laws since the 1930s, and it was debated in Congress between 2009 and 2010. It was signed into law by President Obama on January 4th, 2011, and the bill really has four main pieces. Um, the first one is around preventing food safety problems, and that's where the two, bill, uh, two regulations that we'll be talking about today are uh, authorized. Um, one of the regulations is around standards for produce safety, and the other set of regulations are around requirements for preventive controls in food facilities. But the bill also talks about det detecting and responding to food safety problems and includes mandatory recall authority for the Food and Drug Administration. And it talks about improving safety of imported food. There is also um, a series of miscellaneous provisions in the bill. FISMA also included a number of provisions and amendments to advance sustainable agriculture priorities and ensure a flexible regulatory framework for food systems and sustainable production systems. That included uh, provisions around scale appropriate regulations. It included provisions to protect on-farm conservation and wildlife practices. FISMA required uh, the Food and Drug Administration to complement and not contradict national organic program regulations. There are also provisions around minimizing extra regulations for low risk processing that is part of value added production, such as making jams and making honeys. honey. There was a provision to streamline and reduce unnecessary paperwork for farmers and small processors to allow identity preserved marketing as an option in place of government traceback controls. And there was funding uh, for a training, for food safety training through a new competitive grants program uh, that unfortunately hasn't been funded yet, but there was a training program included in FISMA. And then there were provisions to ensure flexibility for small and very small businesses. So essentially that is the mandate from Congress to the Food and Drug Administration about how they should implement FISMA. 
And now we are um, in the implementation phase. So Sarah, if you could just advance the slide. Great. So the proposed regulations uh, were released earlier this year in January, and they are proposed regulations. So that means that there is an opportunity for the public to comment. And the Food and Drug Administration has extended the comment period twice. And the deadline for public comment is um, November 2015. And so this is a problem we're having uh, technically. OK, we've fixed it. All right. So now I'm going to get into the details of the first rule, the proposed produce rule. Uh, so Sarah, if you could just advance the slide, that'd be great. FDA has proposed standards for growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of produce for human consumption. And the standards they've proposed focus on the um, eight bullet points in the slide. So they've proposed standards around personnel qualifications and training, around health and hygiene, around agricultural water, around biological soil amendments of animal origin, around domesticated and wild animals, standards for growing, harvesting, packing, and holding activities, standards for equipment, tools, building, and sanitation, and then they've set separate standards for the production of sprouts. Slide, please. So in terms of who is covered and what type of produce is covered, you can assume generally that if you grow, or you should assume generally that if you grow produce, you might be covered by these regulations. There are exemptions and there are modified requirements. And so the exe outright exemptions to the produce rule include produce that's rarely consumed raw, like potatoes and beets and winter squash. So FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is assuming that there is a kill step involved there and that it, it's not eaten raw, the, the fruit or the vegetable is not eaten raw, so it doesn't pose as high of a risk. Um, produce for personal or on-farm consumption is exempt from the regulations. And then FDA has chosen to exempt farms that sell an annual average uh, value of food during a three-year period that is less than $25,000 from the regulations. And that calculation is based on um, the value of all the food sold, not just covered produce. And then there are a series of modified requirements. The first set of modified requirements are on produce that will receive commercial processing further down the supply chain. And then there are farms that qualify under what was called the Tester Hagen Amendment. Uh, and Sarah, if you could move the slide forward. So the Tester Hagen Amendment during the legislative phase of FISMA was focused on making sure that there was a scale and supply chain appropriate um, regulation for certain types of farms and facilities. So in the produce standards, the Tester Hagen Amendment has a two-part test um, for growers to figure out if they qualify for the modified requirements. So first, um, a farmer has to have an average annual monetary value in a previous three year in a previous three year period of less than five hundred thousand dollars of all food. So your gross sales of all food has to be lower than five hundred thousand and you have to sell the majority of your food directly to a consumer or what is called a retail food establishment, such as a restaurant or a grocery store that is in the same state or within a 275 mile radius. If you meet that two-part eligibility test, then in the produce standards, you have pretty minimal requirements and you have to provide information about uh, with your complete business address on a label or a sign at the point of sale. And that includes, that includes um, you know, invoices sent through internet e-sales, for example. So you have to provide your complete business address at the point of sale. Slide, please. So for farms who do not meet that two-part eligibility test and who are covered in the produce rule, they have to comply with the standards. And there are the all the different standards that I mentioned earlier on the slide. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on a few of the standards to talk about kind of where what the real issues are that we've identified and heard from 
farmers about and um, what we'd like FDA to do. So FDA has set standards for um, the use of biological soil amendments of animal origin. Uh, that includes manure, it includes compost, it includes fish emulsion, blood meal, bone meal, <clears throat> any sort of soil amendment that is made with, um, you know, animal parts. Or, um, and what they're proposing is an excessive interval between the application of manure and harvest and the application between compost and harvest. So what they're saying is there needs to be a nine-month interval between the application of manure and the harvest of a crop if it's you know covered by the produce rule, so it's produce that's usually consumed raw, and then a 45-day interval between the application of compost and harvest. And the concerns are that this standard discourages the use of manure and compost made with animal material, and that's a foundational practice in organic systems, in sustainable production systems, and in many diversified farming systems. It conflicts directly with the National Organic Program regulations, which require three to four months, depending upon how you're applying the manure, and uh, don't require any interval if you're using compost that's um, you know, made according to the, the National Organic Program regulations. And then the standard is based on very limited scientific evidence. So what we're asking farmers and other interested consumers or concerned consumers to do is to talk about your current practices on your farm and urge FDA not to exceed the organic standard. Slide, please. Another area where there's an issue in the proposed standards are around on-farm natural resource conservation. The standards themselves do not explicitly protect or promote conservation practices, even if there were requirements in the law to do so, and it does not incorporate the concept of co-management, which is that there are certain practices that advance both food safety and conservation. And the reason why this is so important is because in response to previous um, outbreaks, a number of farmers have been required by their buyers to remove conservation practices because there was a thought that perhaps they might, you know, be a food safety problem. Well, and that hasn't necessarily been shown to be the case, so we want to make sure that conservation is included in the standards. There's a real lack of clarity on the grazing standards, um, and it's not clear how long um, an interval FDA is requiring be between the grazing of a field and then subsequent harvest in that field. And then they've recently started an environmental impact statement process, and that is uh, a process that we support but they've started it really late in the game and uh, we're concerned that they won't be able to get through the full process. So what we're asking farmers to do is explain your current conservation practices and urge FDA to be proactive about conservation. Slide, please. Then there are standards around agricultural water and that includes water that is used in irrigation, water that's used to wash, uh, produce, um, water that comes into contact with covered produce. And the standard that FDA is proposing is really based around um, testing of water, treatment of water, and then regular maintenance and inspection of the water system. And there are a number of concerns. Um, generally, what one of the major concerns is that this standard will not be will not be able to be implemented by farms across the country because it's just out of sync with what, how farms use water and what they're able to do. As an example, the standard would require weekly water testing for surface water and monthly for groundwater. And the test is for, uh, would be for generic E. coli, so not pathogenic E. coli, which is a food safety concern, but generic E. coli, which is you know, pretty broadly present in the environment. And it's based on the Environmental Protection Agency's recreational water standard. And the standard does incentivize the treatment of water systems, um, even if there aren't really any kind of applicable chemicals that are allowed yet for irrigation water. And then there are going to be significant costs to the implementation of this standard. And FDA has really said, you know, we're trying to understand what is a workable standard for farms because we recognize that this standard is not necessarily based in science and isn't really based in risk. So 
We're asking farmers to explain the standard uh, or explain how the standard will impact them and urge FDA to come up with a risk-based scientific water standard. Slide, please. And then there, uh, you know, one of the really big things that we actually like about the produce rule is that it's taking an integrated approach. And what that means is that it's not requiring different standards not setting different standards for different types of commodities. So if you're a diversified farmer and you grow a lot of different types of vegetables, you won't have to, you know, follow specific regulations for different types of vegetables. And so they've taken a very tentative conclusion to adopt this integrated versus commodity specific approach. And we know that a number of commodity organizations prefer the commodity by commodity approach and that FDA will be hearing from them. So we're asking farmers to explain their farming systems and urge FDA to stick with that integrated approach. So slide please. Now I'm going to switch to the preventive controls rule. So FDA has proposed regulations or requirements that focus on facilities that manufacture and process food for human consumption. I'll get into a little bit more about what, what that actually means uh, to manufacture and process food. Um, but there are two general requirements in the proposed preventive controls rule. The first is around um, hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls. So the rule is requiring facilities, food facilities, to come up with a food safety plan that is pretty extensive and is based on, I don't know how many people on the line are familiar with, the HACCP principles, the hazard analysis and critical control points approach, generally based on that, even there are, there are some differences. So you would have to kind of analyze your system for hazards, identify ways to mitigate those hazards, to monitor those hazards, to, to verify that the monitoring is happening, um, and then take corrective actions and update your food safety plan. So it's pretty extensive. And then the, the rule does update existing good manufacturing practices. It also codifies this term farm mix type facility, which FDA views as an operation that would be subject to the pr produce rule and the, <coughs> and the preventive controls rule. Now I'm going to get into that a little bit more. Slide, please. So essentially, <coughs> one of the kind of key questions in this is what is a facility? In a facility, when I talk about a facility in this context, I mean a facility that would be subject to the preventive controls rule and the requirements potentially that I just talked about. So a facility is defined as, you know, a facility that manufactures, processes, packs, or holds food. And that does include activities done on farm. And I could spend, you know, at least an hour just talking through the definition of a facility and when, what activities trigger that definition. There is a lot of information on our website that Sarah will get into at the end of the webinar that really um, can take you through whether or not you're a facility. But I do want to raise the point that activities done on a farm could trigger that definition of a facility if there are certain uh, processing, packing, or holding activities. And as FDA has defined it right now, activities done to your own agricultural products less often or not as often make you a facility, but if you're doing those same activities done, doing those same activities to someone else's products, then you are more likely a facility. And that includes things like, you know, packing or holding someone else's intact fruits or vegetables. So if you're a CSA and you, you know, augment the produce in your box every once in a while with something from your neighbor's farm, that would, as currently proposed, trigger the definition of a facility. And it's out of sync with the reality of farming. Uh, FDA is assuming that farms only grow food. They don't really assume that they prepare food for sale and then sell it through diverse markets. Slide, please. So if you are a facility, then you might be subject to the preventive controls rule. But there are a series of exemptions from the HARPSIA requirements. So remember that the preventive controls rule has two main requirements the hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls requirements and the update to the good manufacturing practices. 
the HARPC piece or that hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls piece is really the new set of requirements. And the exemptions from those are the following. Um, certain on-farm low-risk processing activities, such as making jams and maple syrup or honey, um, if you're a very small or a small business, means that you're exempt from the HARPC requirements. Um, and I'll get into the definitions of <clears throat> very small business in another slide. Seafood juice, low acid canned foods, dietary supplements, and alcoholic beverages are currently regulated under other regulations, and so they're exempt from the HARPC requirements. Activities within the farm definition, uh, and here we get into kind of some of the tricky stuff around the definitions of when you're a facility and when you're a farm, but FDA is trying to distinguish between activities done on a farm as part of farming and then activities done on a farm as part of manufacturing and processing. So um, I'll get a little bit more into that in a later slide. Then certain facilities that only store packaged foods or raw agricultural commodities that are not fruits and vegetables for further processing are also exempt from the HARPC requirements. Slide, please. And then there are a series of modified requirements. And this is the implementation of the Tester-Hagen Amendment that I mentioned at the beginning um, of the presentation and also in the, in the produce rule section, um, that if you qualify for these modified requirements, then you need to meet certain different types of requirements. So in the produce rule, there was a two-part eligibility test. In the um, preventive controls rule, there's an additional option, which is if you're a very small business, and I'll get into that definition in another slide, or then if you meet that two-part eligibility test, which includes, uh, and the first part of that is your average annual monetary value in a previous three-year period is less than $500,000 of, of all food that you've sold, and you sell the majority of your food directly to a consumer or a retail food establishment, such as a restaurant or a grocery store within state or within a 275 mile radius. So if you're either a very small business or you meet that two part eligibility test, then, slide please, then you're subject to the following, modifying, the following modified requirements, which are more extensive than the modified requirements in the produce rule. You'd have to submit documentation of your status as what they're calling a qualified facility to FDA, and you would have to submit documentation of compliance with other non-federal food safety law and provide notification to consumers, or you would have to submit documentation identifying potential hazards and monitoring of preventive controls. Slide, please. So in addition to who is covered and how, um, there are a number of issues in the preventive controls rule uh, that are part of who is covered and how. One is that Congress did say to FDA, you know, CSAs, farmers markets, roadside stands, they should really not be included in this definition of a facility. But FDA has failed to make this clarification right now. Um, despite the mandate from Congress. And so, you know, we're asking uh, farmers and other direct marketers to explain how you market your products and urge FDA to fix this issue so that, you know, CSAs and direct marketers that may otherwise trigger that facility definition are, are not included in that so, so that we don't run up against those issues of, you know, having a CSA that packs someone else's produce in a box being a facility. Slide, please. And then we come back to the issue of the definition of a very small business. So remember, um, the definition of a very small business is important because it can make you eligible for the modified requirements, or if the only types of processing that you do are processing activities on a farm that FDA considers low risk, like making jams and maple syrup, then you don't have to implement the HARPC requirements that um, around uh, that are part of the preventive controls rule. So the definition of very small business, they're, they're giving three options. 
The first is 250,000 in gross sales of all food. Second is less than uh, 500,000 in gross sales of all food. And then the last is under a million in gross sales of all food. And so some of the concerns, um, they're focusing these definitions again on the value of all foods and not, and not just covered products. So for um, mid-scale farms or family farms that do commodity production and they're interested in diversifying into any sort of value-added production, they may be subject to either the full HARPSE requirements or you know, potentially the modified requirements if um, they just want to you know, sell a little jam or you know, start a new value-added business um, and we're concerned that if the definition is not realistic, that small facilities, especially on-farm facilities, may be regulated like, like big facilities. So we're asking people to explain their gross sales, if, if they're comfortable doing that, and urge FDA to, to support the, the one million in covered product definition of very small business. Slide, please. So issues in both proposed rules, and these are issues that um, both apply to the produce rule and to the preventive controls rule. I'm, gonna, I'm coming back to this definition of what is a farm and what is a facility. So there are confusions around foundational definitions like farm and facility and assumptions that farms only produce raw agricultural commodities and don't prepare and sell food through markets and supply chains. Um, and then you'll see on the slide that uh, when you pack or, as an example, when you pack or hold someone else's agricultural products, you become a facility. So these are uh, not, these are not, <laughs> these do not reflect the reality of, of what farming is today. Um, and so we are really encouraging farmers to talk about activities that occur on farm, including to someone else's agricultural products and to say that those activities should not make them a facility. Slide, please. The proposed rules have failed to adequately implement the scale and supply chain appropriate options through the Tester Hagen Amendment. So they have the bare bones in there, but there are a number of concerns that uh, really will be an issue around the implementation of those modified requirements in the field. So there's a failure to clarify key terms, especially in the circumstances that would lead to a withdrawal. So if you are a qualified farm or a qualified facility and you, you know, are subject to the modified requirements and don't have to meet the, the full, uh, don't have to implement the full sets of regulations, um, your, your qualified farm or your qualified facility but FDA can withdraw that status, and there are a number of problems around the withdrawal, including the failure to require any sort of evidence that there's a problem on your farm. And FDA, as currently proposed, could just come onto the farm and say, you know, I think this is a problem without actually proving it. And then there's a failure to establish a reasonable process around the withdrawal and the restitution of, of that status as a qualified farm or a qualified facility. So we're asking FDA, or asking farmers to to tell FDA that it has to define key terms, uh, require evidence for a withdrawal, and create a process for getting status back as a qualified exempt farm or a qualified facility. Slide, please. And then um, just, just to note what the cost, the estimated costs of compliance are, and these are the costs that FDA has um, estimated for uh, implementing the rules. And so there are high costs without adequate training and technical assistance. So for the produce rule, if you're a farm that does not meet the Tester Hagen, that two-part eligibility threshold, and you have to come under the full set of regulations, FDA estimates that if you're a very small farm, so that means um, 250000 or less in, in gross sales, then your costs of compliance would be around $4,700 annually. And that if you're a small farm, so that's between $250,000 and $500,000, that your costs of compliance would be, between, would be around $13,000 annually. And then if you're a large farm, which is greater than $500,000 in gross sales, then you'd have upwards of $30,000 
in costs, in compliant costs annually. So that means that if you're subject to the full produce rule and you're, you're, not, you're not eligible for those modified requirements, then you would have these annual compliance costs. And then just to give you a sense for preventive controls, if, you have to, if you're a facility that has to comply with the full HARPC requirements, so those hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls requirements, then FDA estimates, estimates $13,000 per year to comply. So the concerns around this are that you know, farms risk going out of business, there'll be increased barriers for beginning farmers, and that we'll see further concentration in the farming sector. So we're asking farmers to comment to FDA that FDA must base cost estimates on those unrealistic assumptions and decrease the compliance costs or else we'll see a, a big shift in farming in the U.S. So thanks again, Ariane, for getting us into the nitty-gritty of the rules. And again, this is Sarah. And I'm going to talk just to you a little bit about given what's at stake, uh, given the complexity of these rules and, and just what they may mean for farmers and for food systems, how you can have an impact right now on the proposed rules. So just a little bit of overview. I heard someone ask, uh, someone asked a question earlier, well, you know, given that FDA can just ignore comments, you know, why do we even bother reaching out? Uh, well, making change, making change, especially when it comes to federal policy and federal rules, it takes all of us, it takes every tactic we have, and we have to speak out even if we have an uphill battle, even if it's a really hard case to make, even if we're not sure whether or not anyone's listening on the other end. Uh, the answer is they are. Uh, making comments to FDA is, technically speaking, the only means through which the public can weigh in on these proposed rules before they become final law. That means we've got, we've got a bullhorn we should pick it up and we should use it and we should make sure that FDA hears loud and clear from consumers, from farmers, uh, from advocates, from entrepreneurs, from organizations, from researchers, from academics, from everyone, what they think and that they have the opportunity to weigh in. Whether or not, you know, how much impact that will have, it remains to be seen, but it's absolutely 100% critical. This is the most important way and this is an absolutely critical time to do that. Just a couple of notes for you. Uh, as we've said a couple times, these rules are still in draft form. They're not yet the law of the land, and that means this is our chance before they're final to influence and to help, F help show FDA what the concerns we have are, and also to propose ways that will ensure these rules work both for safe food and for farmers. Every single one of you, uh, whether you're a consumer, a farmer, a business owner, you are a stakeholder, you are the public, you absolutely have a right to speak up and to speak out to FDA. Uh, you definitely don't need to be an expert with a PhD in soil microbiology, though that would be helpful. You can, <laughs> your voice matters from whatever perspective you bring to the table. And as I said earlier, the comment period is really our best opportunity to weigh in and to ensure that these rules work for food safety and work for farmers. FDA really truly has to read every single comment that comes in uh, when and if the government shutdown ends. The, those comments are coming in. Um, the website and the mail option are both still live. You can comment throughout the shutdown. When they come back, they absolutely can and will read them. So what I'm going to do is break down just some resources, a couple of how-tos, and then some resources we have for consumers, uh, for farmers, and for organizations. And so we'll try to address some of the questions I saw in the comments about, you know, what if I'm a consumer? How do I frame my comments? So let's talk about that. So take an action. How do I do it? Right now, like I said, the comment period is open. FDA wants to hear from you. Um, you can comment two primary ways. You can comment online or you can comment via the postal mail. They still take snail mail comments. You can find detailed instructions. Uh, a step-by-step -step guide both for the online process and a mailing address on the website on the screen. It's a, it's a little shortened link. It's a bit.ly slash 2 fix -sysma. You should uh, see it on your screen. Right there, like I said, we've got detailed instructions for both options for submitting those comments to the right place. What should I say? All right, this is where we get into the meat of it. 
so again, like I said, every single one of us is a stakeholder in this process. These rules will affect everyone. Uh, and to that end, the most effective thing you can do is to make your comments personal, to have them reflect your story and the ways in which you know these rules will affect you. That means uh, if you're a consumer, uh, FDA wants to hear what are the kind of values you bring to the food choices you make? Where do you buy your food? Um, what are you know? Do you have do you have a hard time finding food in your community? Are you know what kind of are you concerned that rules could impact the food you find in your community or say in your kid's school? So as a consumer, you know, talk about your values, talk about where you buy your food, from whom you buy your food. If you're a farmer, you especially your story in this case especially matters. Um, talk about what kind of food you grow, the kind of practices you already put in place on your farm. Um, you know, why, you know, what you do, where you sell it, the kind of operation you operate. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the resources we have around commenting in a second, but that story piece is really critical. Making it, you know, drawing a, con drawing a clear line between this, I'm concerned about this piece of the rules, and here's what I do on my farm. Use data when you have it. For any researchers out there uh, who have done some work or research on these kinds of issues, Studies are helpful, um, records are helpful, anything like that. Two other things, including a clear ask. FDA is just like, uh, it's just like Congress, it's just like you and me. Um, we're much more responsive to a complaint when someone links it to a specific action. If someone just tells me, oh, I'm not happy, I, I feel bad, but I can't do much about it. Um, FDA, likewise, would really like to know not just if there's a problem, but what would make it better. And so that's where you'll recall just a, a few slides back when Ariane was talking about the manure and compost issues in the rules. In this case, an example of an ask would be, we don't think that these FDA, these new rules should supplant the already existing federal rules around the national organic standards. In our case, the ask would be, FDA, you know, FDA's rules need to line up with the already existing, already on the books organic rules. That's an example of an ask. You could link that to your own story. I'm an organic farmer. I use, this is, you know, I use compost. This is why I use it. These rules would cause a problem. It would make it hard for me to use compost in my operation. That would be the kind of example of what FDA needs to hear. Um, one final point, asking questions is totally fine. If you, after taking a look through some of the resources that we have to offer, um, if you've taken a spin through the rules themselves, if you're unclear about whether you may or may not be affected, about whether the kinds of farmers you work with, about the kind of food you buy would or would not be affected, uh, reflecting that lack of clarity to FDA is okay too. It's important to remember, you know, the rules are long, they're complex. They definitely, but you know, those are there's people on the other end of that. They forget things too. If they've not been clear about a rule, we want to make sure they know that as well. All right, one more important thing that I must tell you before we get a little bit into the resources. Comment period is open. The comment period is only open through November 15th of this year. That's just a little over a month. So that means now is the time to get commenting. So if you take one thing away from this webinar today with regards to making comments, I hope that it is submit a comment and submit it before November 15th. So let's talk a little bit about resources. So we're, we here at INSEC, with all of, along with all of our partners, along with all of the farmers and organizations we work with, really hope you come away today committed to do three things. That's first to get informed, um, to take a spin yourself through the materials, to ask your own questions, to get familiar with what's at stake, uh, to take action, to commit to speaking out to FDA, to take a stand and say, you know what? And, and you know, you may not, you may only choose. There may be one issue that really matters to you. There may be ten. Both are okay. And then finally, that you commit to spreading the word, to helping make sure uh, that other folks you work with, that your neighbors, that other farmers you know, also know about these rules and have the chance to themselves get informed and take action. So, what do we have to help you do that? First off, if you're a consumer, if you are, if you're on the phone right now, um, watching this webinar, and you just happen to be someone who likes to buy at your local farmer's market, if you're a parent concerned about um, fresh produce in your kids' schools, you absolutely can and should speak out. Uh, just, to, just to give you a little overview of what we've got, again, that website at the top, 
that is our Take Action page. There you can find an overview of the issues. You can find a sample comment to FDA that you can customize uh, to tell your story and to reflect your priorities. You can also uh, you can find directions for how to comment. You can also find a, a petition. We're also running a, a large-scale petition in addition to these comments to, again, help show FDA the full weight and the full volume of how many people care about both food safety and sustainable agriculture. And finally, there's some tools to help you spread the word. There's an easy little one-click tweet and Facebook post. There's materials you can download and share. And you can also sign up for updates if you want to get more news. If you're a farmer, if you're a farmer, we've got some especially uh, meaty and detailed resources for you because as you have probably figured out if you've tried to take a look through the rules, they're long and they're complicated and it's really important that folks have a chance to understand them. So I've linked two websites up here. That, that bit.ly link is again the action page. The top one, sustainableagriculture.net slash FISMA, is our resource page. That's where you're going to find a whole wealth of information aimed at helping farmers get informed about these rules. On that page, you're going to find detailed overview of both the produce and preventive controls rule. You'll find some guidance about, am I affected? Uh, I know some of you ask questions about, well, what if I do this? Well, what about this kind of food? Is there somewhere a list of what FDA considers processing? The answer to all of those is yes. We've put up a bunch of guidance to help work you through that. Uh, that especially includes that in, we include links to um, those FDA lists of processing, things like that. We also include some special guidance for folks who fall into some regulatory gray areas around CSAs, food hubs, folks who do value-added processing, and folks who do direct marketing. So just a heads up that that's there. Uh, take it, use it, run with it. Um, we go into detail over each of the issues that Ariane just went through in her presentation with links back to the original, back to the original rules so you can Go and actually read the rules for yourself, make your own decisions, get informed about the issues. If you want to take action, you say, okay, you know what, I'm concerned. I, I also, I'm totally into food safety, but I'm really concerned about this issue and it may cause a problem for my farm and you want to make a comment. We've included as well on that action page a farmer's commenting template. It's a couple of pages long and it includes, kind of like I said earlier, some guiding questions to help you tell your farm story and link you know, what you do on your farm to what's at issue in the rules. And just like for consumers, if you too, you know, if you want to share something with your CSA members, uh, with other folks at your farmer's market, we have materials that we're glad to share. You'll find some online. If you don't see what you're looking for, please don't hesitate to email us and we can help get you set up with what you need. One last piece, uh, resources for organizations. If you're on the phone and you're a nonprofit um, and you want to work to engage your stakeholders around these issues, all the resources I just talked about are there for you too. We also have available, if you are interested in sending out action alerts, engaging with social media through Facebook or Twitter, we have lots of materials you can use. Again, if you're interested in you know, the farm to school aspects or the organic farming aspects, uh, talk to us. We would love to work with you. We'd love to help you uh, understand what's at stake and get involved in speaking out and encouraging others to do the same. So just a couple of screen caps to show you these pages in action. This right here is sustainableagriculture.net slash FISMA. You'll see there on the left, there's that overview. There's who is affected. That's that guidance for farmers to help them understand if they will or won't be affected. There's issue pages learn about the issues. There's Speak Out Today. That's where you'll find the commenting instructions and other tips and tricks for getting involved. And just additional resources. We're tracking a bunch of stuff. Then, when you click that big image right in the middle, that fixed FISMA image, you'll be taken to our commenting page. It looks like this. When you're here, you know you're on the page that gives you the tools and guidance to submit a comment to FDA. Uh, there's, it's split up by farmers or consumers. Either of you can read either of them, but the farmer one is, again, as I said, a little more detailed because farmers, you know, may want to engage, you know, really pretty deeply to tell their farm story. So again, it's all there. Take a look, make use of it, weigh in and weigh in right away. All right. Last slide before we have a little more time for questions. Again, if you take just a few things away from today, I hope that they are absolutely this is something that I want to weigh in on. I will speak out, I will submit a comment to FDA. 
before that November 15th deadline. Um, to the extent that you can, submit a comment, help us spread the word, help make sure that the other folks you know who may care about this, these, these issues also have a chance to get informed, to ask their own questions, and to get involved and submit comments. It's going to take all of us. Like I said earlier, um, you know, we've got a huge task in front of us to make, a, to make our case to FDA to say, these are issues that really matter. We need to fix these issues in the rules before their final law uh, for the sake of organic ag, sustainable ag, local food, conservation, um, for a better food and farm future. This is our chance. And so now is the time. And with that, uh, we have about 15 more minutes. So why don't we take a spin and see what other questions we have? Oh boy, there's a whole bunch of questions. Awesome. Let's see, where to begin? And again, like I said earlier, if we do not get your question now, we will by all means uh, follow up with you afterwards so that we can. All right. Looking, looking for, what about sending multiple comments? That is, uh, to send one comment as an industry professional and a separate as a consumer? Heard multiple comments from the same person. This is from a question from Rob. Um, Rob, you can absolutely comment more than once if you like, and it's, it's especially if you have a professional position under which you may need to, to be careful about what you do or don't say in your professional capacity. There's no upper limit to how many times you can comment. And to my knowledge, it shouldn't discount your comment as long as they are substantively different in terms of the content. So if you wanted to submit 500 identical comments, that would not be very helpful. <laughs> but if you want to submit two different comments on a different set of issues representing a different perspective, I think that is uh, eminently OK. And there's no upper limit. And yes, Harry, that's a great point. And thank you for flagging that. Harry says, please point out that the best way to comment is to write ahead of time and copy into the form. Couple of key points. I said earlier that folks can comment online. That's the way to go. Let me just tell you a little bit about that. You comment online at a website called regulations.gov. Our comment landing page has some shortcut links to take you to the right commenting box so you don't end up commenting on another rule. Um, but when you get there, you're gonna notice a little, it kind of looks like a petition form. You'll put your name down, There'll be a big empty box where you can put your thoughts. What we recommend that folks do is to take a little time and, and put their comments together in, say, a Microsoft Word file before they paste them into that box. There's a, a pretty small word limit. So regulations.gov allows and encourages folks to also submit a file as a PDF or a Word doc as an attachment. So again, it's really important, um, even if you just spend five or 10 minutes typing up some thoughts into a file, saving that file, and making sure that it gets in there and it is uploaded along with your comment. That's a great point, and that's a really good thing to think. Um, our step-by-step -step instructions that are on our INSAC website also include that guidance because that is really important. Thanks for pulling that out. And someone asked, is the online comment site still open during the shutdown? Yes, it is. Um, Curiously enough, while many other federal websites are shut down, regulations.gov is open for business. You can absolutely submit comments throughout the shutdown. The one thing I will add there, um, this is Ariane, is that um, FDA, before it posts the comments publicly, has to kind of itself view the comment and then, and then post it to the website. So, Right now, they don't have people there who are posting comments that they've received to the website. So you can make a comment, but don't be surprised if you don't see the comment afterwards. You should get, if you're doing submitting the comment online, you should get a confirmation email once you've submitted the comment. But if you go and look, you know, in the next five minutes or next hour or, you know, until the government, during this government shutdown, you won't see your comment posted publicly because they don't have people there to, to manu you know, to, to approve the comments and put them up on the website. Yeah, thanks, Arianna. That's a good point. Uh, another question is, uh, where do you find information regarding what types of activities are defined as processing to trigger the preventive controls rule? So I just mentioned that's where I say that that am I affected and the learn about the issues pages on Insects FISMA website. We link directly to those lists so you can go and see them for yourself. Let's 
see what other we have a few. I think we have time for just a few more questions here. Um, we have a question, and this is a question I think about uh, value-added processing, Ariane, for you. Uh, what about the difference between acidified and lacto-fermented foods? They are not considered low-risk processing activities. Um, and so if you're making those fermented foods, you are considered a facility, and then you would either be subject to, you know, you could qualify for the modified requirements, um, but they are not considered the low risk processing. What we are going to be encouraging FDA to do is to um, accept kind of current good manufacturing practices that people use when they do that type of fermentation as, as you know, a good enough, as good enough proof that um, people who are fermenting food um, and they really don't distinguish between the types of fermentation uh, are. So I would encourage you to make a comment, say this is the, ferment, the type of fermentation that I do. I want to make sure that it's, you know, covered, it, I, it covered in the current good manufacturing practices, but it should not be considered a, a high-risk activity. Great. And we have another question. Um, this is a question from Kiana. It says, touching on your comment regarding CSAs um, and augmenting their shares with produce from other farms. So would a CSA that offers additional products from another farm trigger the definition of facility? Short answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> As currently proposed. Um, so there are, so this is one of the big issues that we want to make sure people comment on um, so that FDA gets this right and doesn't just assume that just because you're including somebody else's produce in your box that you're also a facility. We have someone asking how is aquaponics addressed within the ag standards, within the ag water proposed rules? They are not addressed <laughs> at all. Um, so I would encourage you to make a comment around them. And we've actually heard from uh, folks who work in aquaponics about how FDA clearly did not think about their production systems when coming up with this proposed rule. And that is indeed the case. So here's a good question, um, and a nuts and bolts question. Can you run through what the modified requirements under the Tester Hagen exemption would look like? And so it it depends on whether you're whether you're you're eligible for those requirements through the produce rule or through the preventive controls rule, because if you are just doing produce and you're not triggering any of the processing definitions that make you a facility or any of the other definitions that make you a facility, the modified requirement is that you have to provide your complete business um, address at the point of sale. So that's essentially a sign at the farmer's market, um, you know, on an invoice if you do uh, sales through the internet, but at, at that point where you're, where you're selling the food to the consumer, you'd have to show your complete business address. If you are a facility and you're eligible for the modified requirements under Tester Hagen, then um, they are more <laughs> explicit and more cumbersome. So you have to submit documentation to FDA saying that you are a qualified facility and you have to either then comply with, show that you're complying with existing non-federal food safety law and notify, provide notification to your consumers about that, or you have to um, submit documentation that shows that you're implementing, that you've identified potential hazards and you're implementing some sort of um, way to control those hazards. Great. Uh, we have a question where someone's asking, uh, is there any language in the proposed rules that gets at some of the root causes of food safety issues, including um, someone asking about things like factory farming, GMOs, et cetera. 
and if there's not that language in the proposed rules, how might consumers or advocates sort of speak out on that elephant in the room? Yeah, so FDA is implementing, you know, the mandate from the Food Safety Modernization Act, and in that, um, it did not focus on GMOs and what role they play in 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 food safety. And um, but it did say that FDA had to consider uh, chemical, physical, biological, and radiological hazards in produce production, and they've chosen to focus more narrowly, and so they are not focusing on, for example, chemical hazards in produce production. So there is, there is a way to address some of the elephants in the room around some of the, the bigger issues around food safety and public health, but, um, and you're obvi obviously welcome to point to those other issues in your comment, but I, FDA through this rulemaking might not, isn't, won't be able to address GMO issues. Um, if they, if they hear from enough people that they should be taking into consideration chemical concerns, um, they do have to look at chemical hazards in production. Here's another nuts and bolts question. Are these gross sales numbers automatically adjusted every year for inflation? Yes, they are adjusted for inflation. And then we have a question, Ariane, that I know gets to something that's uh, definitely been in lots of discussion around here, which is the way that FDA has chosen to define farm and facility. And he's, uh, and you may want to take a look at that question. It starts with one of the fundamentals and see if we want to. So yeah, basically, so like, question, how, does, how does FDA delineate between farm and facility, and why is that a problem? Yeah, so it's one of the the big emphasis, big emphases of of the NSAC campaign and work, and we've um, talked about it in a number of ways on today's presentation. And FDA uh, is some has its hands tied somewhat behind its back in terms of what the definition of a facility is and what the definition of a farm is because of previous existing legislation and regulation but they have also opened the door to amending certain definitions um, by either clarifying existing definitions or amending definitions around what is considered manufacturing and processing and when you're doing that to whose produce. So FDA has heard this from a lot of different, um, you know, grower-based organizations, uh, large and small, and they realize that their definitions of farm and facility are a problem. And so we'll be commenting heavily. Uh, a number of the issues around that are included in the templates. And um, it is kind of a foundational piece of, of how these regulations will impact food and farming systems moving forward. So we definitely want people commenting on those issues. All right, and we are actually at just before 6 o'clock, so I think with that we may need to wrap up unless there are any, I know I'm just looking to see if we've missed any questions. I think here's uh, one last nuts and bolts question for you, Ariane, that I missed earlier. It says, we use flathead minnows in our irrigation pond as a realistic index of water quality and hit safety and contamination due to their sensitivity. Has FDA considered such schemes? FDA has not considered such schemes, um, and I would encourage you to talk about them in your comments. What FDA has included for a small part of the water standard and a small part of the biological soil amendment standard is an option for farmers to use an alternative practice if they can show uh, through evidence that that practice provides the same level of public health protection as what FDA is proposing. And we don't really talk about that as a viable option because the threshold that FDA has placed is, is very high and it puts the burden on the farmer to show somehow that the practice they're doing on the farm uh, provides an equivalent level of public health protection and 
and that's just uh, you know an unreasonable expectation to think that farmers should be um, you know responsible the ones responsible for providing the scientific evidence on their practices and also they apply really narrowly um, but I did want to mention that and I I do think that um, FDA would really benefit from hearing about how you currently deal with uh, that type of testing because they're actively or that type of you know determining whether your water is of adequate quality because that is something that uh, they're looking for actively looking for feedback on all right one last question will insect publish their comments to the membership prior to submitting to the FDA so we have made available the comment templates that Sarah is talking about. Um, we will be working on the or organizational comments that NSAC is submitting until the deadline. And so I don't want to make any unreasonable expectations that we would be able to, um, you know, have people, uh, especially partner organizations, look at them. But we are happy to share information with partner organizations, farmers, concerned consumers, provide resources, and, um, you know, think through issues that clearly the rules do not address. All right, and with that, just uh, one last note again. If we missed your question, if you have more questions, please do not hesitate to be in touch. Uh, this is a huge issue, food safety matters. Uh, making sure these rules work for farmers, for local food, for conservation, in addition to food safety, really matters. If you have any questions about information, about how to get involved, if you have anything at all like that, please do not hesitate to reach out. And with that, I think we will close this up and we look forward to working with you this fall. Thank you, everybody.